current conditions. Recent prophecy. Today we're going to look at getting to where we're going from where we're at right now. How are we going to do that without fear, without worry, without being anxious? I'm going to tell you something I hadn't touched on yet. There's a theory out there of a new world order. It's long been associated as an unprovable conspiracy about a globalist takeover of world economic, political, and religious systems. The media and many politicians say only a right-wing conservative or religious nut would believe any of this. But, coming from both, now today, many world leaders have stepped up to advocate this reset, this new world order. It's not hidden anymore. It used to be rumors and innuendos. People deny it. Now they're stepping up from the leaders of our nation to the leaders of many, many, many nations. They want to do this reset and get global control over just about everything. It's called the New World Order, the Great Reset, Agenda 21, 2030. They're looking for this whole movement to be controlled with identifying numbers. Man, where have I read about that before? They're calling it a vaccine passport, but it's controlling numbers. There's even talk of digitally implanting it. Hmm, I think I've seen that before too. This naturally leads us to questions about the relationship between this great reset of laws, the changing of boundaries, and the coming of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the end times. In Revelation 17, 12 through 14, we're told what is coming. Starting with verse 12. The ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. Together they will go to war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. And his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. That's what's coming. These ten kings are going to arise. They're going to give power to the beast. That's their sole purpose. You know, there's different uh, confederations now of nations that have joined together. They're going to go to battle with the Lamb. That means you. That means Christians. Given the nature of the Antichrist's future uh, government, which is a fact, it seems that any push for a centralized economic, political, religious power would align totally with Satan's objectives. It would match what Satan wants. Regardless of whatever humanitarian goals that they say these are for. Uh, it's to protect boundaries. It's to do this. It's to do that. It's for your good. It's, I don't know about you, but I've been just about fed up with having other people tell me for what's my good, I need to do this. These people, this new world order, seem to preach the good of the many over the needs of the few. God's the exact opposite. He sent Jesus Christ to die for you. There are no few. There's you. That's who Christ died for. If you were the only person on this world that needed saving, Christ would have paid that same price. But it's important for us to try to understand this great reset, this current conditions, the seasons that we're told to look for. Christ said he was so disappointed that we knew the seasons of the weather, but we could not see the seasons of his gospel. We need to look at it from a biblical perspective and consider just how much it affects the nation of Israel. 
Now, if you looked at the PowerPoint that was playing earlier, you saw that I had Israel imprinted on the lower 48 states of the um, United States. Here's how big Israel is or is not. Israel is about 448 times smaller than the United States. 448. We got Israel is point, point, zero point, 0.22 percent. Zero point. The size of the United States is uh, 300 and um, 32 million when this was written. And that makes us bigger than them in population by th um, 324 million. Israel is not populated by a lot, doesn't have a lot of land size, but yet it seems like the whole world's out to try to destroy Israel. It's such a small nation. When you look at it on a map with all these other countries, you just see how small it is. But God takes the small and uses it for his glory. There's some interesting research about this one world government that's coming. I'll probably mess up his name, but phonetically spelled, the best I can say it is Dr. Arnold French Ten Baum, a Jewish scholar of biblical prophecy, identifies a sequence of nine events set to occur before the seven-year tribulation begins. These nine events are part of a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view of prophecy from the Messianic Jewish perspective and fall in line with God's word. Every bit of these nine fall in line with God's word. War one and two, World War three, and all the wars, or World War one and two, and all the wars will continue, uh, wars and rumors of wars. Now we're even talking about nuclear war. And it's not being talked about by a lot of people. A nuclear power has threatened to use nuclear. Wars and rumors of wars. Number two, the reestablishment of Israel as a nation. Ezekiel 36, um, 33, 24, and Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. That happened in 1948. And by the way, the um, rumors and rumors of wars is 20, Matthew 24, 1 through 8. Number three, Jewish control of Jerusalem. This is implied in Daniel 9.27, Matthew 24, 15, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, and Revelation 11, 1, and 2. Israel took uh, control of the whole of Jerusalem after the Six-Day War of 1967. These three events, according to this doctor, this scholar, had happened. They're historical, and they laid a groundwork for what must happen in the future. I've got the word probably in here, because we're dealing with a subjective view from a scholar, but we can't tell for sure for several reasons. But this will probably happen before the seven-year tribulation begins. Number four. We know this is going to happen. An invasion of Israel by a northern alliance of nations. Ezekiel 38, 1 30 through 39, 16. What do we see building today? We see Russia over there, Father. We, we, we see Ukraine. We see all these coalitions coming together. Uh, it's just massive amounts of force going on over there. Israel surrounded by people that hate Israel. Number five, a one moral government, Daniel 7, 23. This will happen. There will be a one moral government. Number six, a federation of ten kingdoms. Wow. European common market comes to mind. But anyhow, we find that in Daniel 7, 24. Number seven, the rise of the Antichrist, Daniel 7, 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. A period of peace and false security. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. A fact. 
And the signing of the seven-year covenant with Israel, Daniel 9.27, when the Antichrist, it's going to be a very personable person, the Antichrist is not going to come with a horn, not going to come with a pitchfork, not going to come looking like the devil. He's going to come looking like light. He's going to come be very charismatic, very personable. But he's going to broker a peace treaty between Israel and these nations that hate Israel. That's a good thing. Israel is going to think, we have peace. We have peace. This list of uh, pre-tribulational events are found in the Messianic Bible Study number 38, available at www.ariel.org. I looked at the site. Looks pretty credible. Credible. One big hindrance to the plans of the Antichrist is the body of Christ. You and me, we're a problem. If Satan could get rid of us, he would, but he can't. There are millions of Christians that interfere with his plans. So what does God do about it? He removes us, takes us out of the game. We will be removed. This way, the fullness of God's plan goes forward. What we call the rapture, the removal of the church, could happen at any time between, obviously, now and the doctor thinks before nine happens. I can't tell you if this global reset that's happening now, this new world order, could be the one world government that's coming that we're told about. It's not possible for that doctor, for me, or anyone else to preach that what's going on now is the beginning of the Antichrist one world order. It's not given us. We don't have that. It looks like there's a lot of good evidence pointing that way. But we don't know how far off the rapture is or when the end times start. We don't know what will come of this plan if it will fall apart. Many have tried to do this, form a one world government, and all have failed to date. Only the Antichrist will be successful. Satan has tried many times to make his plans work, but God has the power to allow or disallow him to operate. If, if, I've used the word probably and I've used the word if, if the goals for the Great Reset are realized, it could give rise to this one world power. It could. Daniel sees it as a terrible thing. We find this in Daniel 7, 23. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it, into, break it to pieces. So there will be a one world government, and it will be a terrible thing. The Great Reset is described on its own website, promotes globalist programs, controls, which would certainly be an aspect of any major one world government. So my question to you this morning is, for three weeks I've given you kind of bad things. I've started this one off with kind of a bad thing. As a Christian, as a believer in Christ, as someone who has a relationship with God, how do you react to this? How do you deal with it? Well, the first thing, the quickest thing, just like that video we've seen, get down on your knees, pray, beg, and scream. But we need to refuse to worry about it. I don't want you to be one bit worried about what's happening, what's going to happen. God's told us everything that's going to happen. We know a lot of it's not pleasant. We're told not to worry. Well, when you have current talk of famine, they're talking famine in the United States. We're talking famine in the United States. We're talking population control. A lot of 
conspiracy theories on that thing, but talking population control. There are people that advocate that this world has about six billion too many people. They kind of think a billion should be about right. So six billion people need to kind of volunteer to leave? I don't know. Nations seem intent on releasing one pandemic after another. And it's not just others. The United States researches and has bio labs that we're finding out about. We're, we've gained so much information in the last two years, it's scary. Most of my life, I've been probably one of the most patriotic people I've ever known. I have really gotten an education in the last two years. Freedoms are compromised. Freedoms are denied. And when this happens, people become worried, anxious, fearful. We do. But here's the good news. You ready for that? Jesus is the answer. He gives us a guide. We have a guide, a living guide to take us through this. It's right here. Here's the key to less worry. Right here. This is the key that unlocks the door. Pray for God's provision and thanking Him and expecting God to provide what you need. We need to pray for. You have not because you've asked not. We need to give thanks. Always give thankfulness. And expect God to deliver what you need. Now, he's probably not going to give you everything you want, but he will give you what you need. Having a mindset that's free of fear, free of worry, gives us the freedom to put our minds and our hearts and our work into the kingdom of God, bringing more people to God. Not fearfully avoiding people, but embracing and bringing, sharing the love of God. Matthew now here's where we're given the instructions. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. This is the New Living Translation. 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you, this is Jesus talking. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and see how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if your God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. That's the Word of God. We're assured that if we seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, doesn't say sin free, doesn't say you'll never stumble, but live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Praise God. Proverbs 12, 2. Good people obtain favor from the Lord, but he condemns those who devise wicked schemes. Evil will always lose. Evil will always lose. We're here on this earth temporarily. All of us are aware of that, except possibly the youngest children. But all of us are aware. Before we're created, before we're born, the time of our leaving was known to God. The circumstances were known to God. The events were known to God. So why do we worry so much about it? Why do we worry 
the pharmacy industry is making zillionaires because we spend everything trying to stay healthy. The beauty industry, we're trying to be beautiful. The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever, 1 John 2, 17. And how are we to pray? We're to pray for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodliness and holiness, 1 Timothy 2, 2. The only reset that's ever going to happen on this earth that will matter is the reset when Jesus returns as the conqueror. That is the great reset. Everything they're talking about now is just man stuff, evil stuff. God resets the earth. We get a new heaven, a new earth. And we're told, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. Revelation 1-7. We're told that Jesus is coming back. We're told that he will vanquish evil. He told that our needs will be supplied. With all this, I don't see how we have a right to worry. I understand I'm not making light of it, but when we think about it from God's perspective, it makes no sense. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, Christ is giving this command to us and to the disciples. Do not be anxious. He repeated it three times. Three times. He knew our tendency is to do the exact opposite, that we're, our tendency is to be anxious and fearful, to anxiously focus on future cares, rather than on God who holds tomorrows in his hand. Bit of, my mother was a wise woman. Wished I'd have got more of it from her, but <laughs> me too. But <laughs> she used to tell me when I would fuss, and I fussed. Oh, I fussed a lot. I fussed about everything. Hard to believe, I know. But I fussed. She'd say, Bobby? Oh, when she says Bobby, you know things are going to get bad. Bobby, will that matter in 100 years? No, Ma. Then why should it matter today? That's godly wisdom to me. We worry about things that aren't going to affect us long term. We're told in many scriptures not to worry or be fearful, but Jeremiah 29, 11 and the 30, 23rd Psalms come to mind. We're told over and over we're not to be anxious about what we eat or wear. Now, kind of wondering why Jesus used those two things, eat and wear. Both are basic survival needs. If you don't eat or drink, you're going to die. Simply that. And if you... You could live all your life completely naked if you're in an enclosure that has heat and air and comfort. But you've got to have something clothing you, protecting you from the elements. Jesus urges us to put our trust in God as the provider. The Christian who is faithful to God's word and committed to the king does not need to be worried about or distracted by everyday life. That's a lesson that I have to remind myself of every single day of my life. Because sometimes I want to get distracted. We need not to be distracted. Putting our confidence in God means trusting He'll take care and provide for us. Matthew 6, 34, Jesus uh, expands His lesson um, challenging the disciples not to worry about these things that come up. But he just had taught them in Matthew 6, 11, when you pray, give us this day our daily bread. We're to ask for God for what we need. You need daily bread. As servants, as servants of God's kingdom, we must live in the present. So many times we want to live in the past, or live in the future. We can't. We live today. We don't, aren't promised tomorrow. Past we can't change. Live in today. In the wilderness, 
God taught the children of Israel the same message. They depended on Yahweh every day for the manna. When they started to worry about the next day, except for the day before the Sabbath, and they stored it, the manna would rot, except for the one time when they would gather enough for two days because they couldn't harvest it on the, um, pick it up on the Sabbath. Each day and every step, we have to depend on God. Lord knows we face many circumstances, situations that cause anxiety. So how can we follow his one rule not to worry? Well, number one is pray. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 presents our most potent weapon against the worry. Here's what we're told. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything and pray about everything. Big concerns, little concerns, pray, but don't worry. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done for you. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. We need to rely on God's grace. Paul says, in order to keep from being uh, coming conceited, I was giving a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Paul took his concerns, his need, and God told him no. So evidently it wasn't a need. It was what Paul wanted. So if you get told no on a need, you might want to look at it and see if that's really a need or if that's just kind of a Bob want. The apostle learned to rely on God. Here's the hardest thing I'm going to ask you to do. Probably almost impossible. Learn to discipline your mind. Learn to discipline your mind. This is hard. Most of us will not say things that are inappropriate, will not say things that would be offensive, but tell me you don't have some of those thoughts on occasion. Okay? It's a battle for me, too. We need to learn to discipline our mind. So how do we do that? Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters... One final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. In 2 Timothy 1.7, God gave us a spirit, not a fear, gave us a spirit, not a fear, but of power and love and self-control. We're given a spirit of self-control to discipline our minds. Focus on what is good, true, beautiful. Then we need to take action. We can't be wholly dedicated to God if we're worrying about tomorrow. If we're worried about everything that's going on. If we're worried about what's happening in the world. What's happening in our country. What's happening in our state. What's happening in our families. If we're worried about that, we can't focus on loving God. Matthew 6, uh, 27. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? The answer is no. And... Peter wisely advises, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. 1 Peter 5, 7. And to sum it up with Paul, one more time. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you have heard from me, saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Philippians 4, 9. Let me ask you. Can people look at you and copy what you're doing? Can they see the example of Christ in you? Can they follow what you do and say, I want to be like that? Not all the time with me. I fail. You probably fail. But that doesn't mean we stop. Taking action means we keep going back to the God, going back to the well, being refilled, going back, seeking forgiveness, and disciplining our minds, our actions, disciplining everything about us so we can focus more fully on God. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this message is the message that you'd had me give. I pray that your thoughts, words, deeds were spoken, Father, not mine. I pray that we will take these messages, Father, and the Holy Spirit will make them real to each of us, Father. Father, what I mess up, I pray the Holy Spirit straightens up, Father, gives enlightenment. Let us focus, Father, on worshiping you fully and not worrying about this silly world, Father, for this is a temporary place. Our home is with you, Father. I pray, Father, for your will to be done, my life, the life of the folks here and in our nation and in our world. Your will be done, Father, not mine. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.